Part 2, Chapter 4, The Realization of Selfless Love It is said that Michelangelo saw, in every rough block of stone, a thing of beauty, awaiting the master hand to bring it into reality. Even so, within each there reposes the divine image, awaiting the master hand of faith and the chisel of patience to bring it into manifestation. And that divine image is revealed and realized as stainless, selfless love. Hidden deep in every human heart, though frequently covered up with the mass of hard and almost impenetrable accreations, is a spirit of divine love, whose holy and spotless essence is undying and eternal. It is the truth in man, it is that which belongs to the Supreme that which is real and immortal. All else changes and passes away. This alone is permanent and imperishable, and to realize this love by ceaseless diligence is the practice of the highest righteousness. To live in it and to become fully conscious in it is to enter into immortality here and now, is to become one with truth, one with God one with the central heart of all things, and to know our own divine and eternal nature. To reach this love, to understand and experience it, one must work with great persistency and diligence upon his heart and mind, must ever renew his patience and keep strong his faith, for there will be much to remove, much to accomplish before the divine image is revealed in all its glorious beauty. He who strives to reach and to accomplish the divine will be tried to the very utmost, and this is absolutely necessary, for how else could one acquire that sublime patience without which there is no real wisdom, no divinity? Every and anon, as he proceeds, all his work will seem to be futile, and his efforts appear to be thrown away now and then, a hasty touch will mar his image, and perhaps when he imagines his work is almost completed, he will find what he imagined to be the beautiful form of divine love, utterly destroyed, and he must begin again with his past bitter experience to guide and help him. But he, who has resolutely set himself to realize the highest, recognizes no such thing as defeat. All failures are apparent, not real. Every slip, every fall, every return to selfishness is a lesson learned, an experience gained, from which a golden grain of wisdom is extracted, helping the striver towards the accomplishment of his lofty object. To recognize that off our vices we can frame a ladder if we will but tread beneath our feet each deed of shame, is to enter the way that leads unmistakably toward the divine, and the failings of one who thus recognizes are so many dead selves upon which he rises, as upon stepping stones to higher things. Once come to regard your failings, your sorrows and sufferings as so many voices telling you plainly where you are weak and faulty, where you fall below the true and the divine, you will then begin to ceaselessly watch yourself, and every slip, every pang of pain, will show you where you are set to work, and what you have to remove out of your heart in order to bring it nearer to the likeness of the divine, nearer to the perfect love. And as you proceed day by day, detaching yourself more and more, from the inward selfishness, the love that is selfless will gradually become revealed to you. And when you are growing patient and calm, when your petulances, tempers and irritabilities are passing away from you, and the more powerful lusts and prejudices cease to dominate and enslave you, then you will know that the divine is awakening within you, that you are drawing near to the eternal heart and that you are not far from that selfless love, the possession of which is peace and immortality. 
Divine love is distinguished from human loves. In this supremely important particular, it is free from partiality. Human loves cling to a particular object to the exclusion of all else. And when that object is removed, great and deep is the resultant suffering to the one who loves. Divine love embraces the whole universe and without clinging to any part, it contains within itself the whole. And he who comes to it by gradually purifying and broadening his human loves until all the selfish and impure elements are burnt out, ceases from suffering. It is because human loves are narrow and confined and mingled with selfishness that they cause suffering. No suffering can result from that love which is so absolutely pure that it seeks nothing for itself. Nevertheless, human loves are absolutely necessary as steps toward the divine, and no soul is prepared to partake of divine love until it has become capable of the deepest and most intense human love. It is only by passing through human loves and human sufferings that divine love is reached and realized. All human loves are perishable, like the forms to which they cling. But there is a love that is imperishable and does not cling to appearances. All human loves are counterbalanced by human hates. But there is a love that admits of no opposite or reaction divine and free from all taint of self, that sheds its fragrance on all alike. Human loves are reflections of the divine love and draw the soul nearer to the reality, the love that knows neither sorrow nor change. It is well that the mother, clinging with passionate tenderness to the little helpless form of flesh that lies on her bosom, should be overwhelmed with the dark waters of sorrow when she sees it laid in a cold earth. It is well that her tears should flow and her heart ache, for only thus can she be reminded of the evanescent nature of the joys and objects of sense and be drawn nearer to the eternal and imperishable reality. It is well that lover, brother, sister, husband, wife, should suffer deep anguish and be enveloped in gloom when the visible object of their affections is torn from them, so that they may learn to turn their affection towards the invisible source of all, where alone abiding satisfaction is to be found. It is well that the proud, the ambitious, the self-seeking should suffer defeat humiliation and misfortune, that they should pass through the scorching fires of affliction, for only thus can the wayward soul be brought to reflect upon the enigma of life. Only thus can the heart be softened and purified and prepared to receive the truth. When the sting of anguish penetrates the heart of human love, when gloom and loneliness and desertion cloud the soul of friendship and trust, then it is that the heart turns toward the sheltering love of the eternal and finds rest in the silent peace. And whosoever comes to this love is not turned away comfortless, is not pierced with anguish nor surrounded with gloom and is never deserted in the dark hour of trial the glory of divine love can only be revealed in the heart that is chastened by sorrow, and the image of the heavenly state can only be perceived and realized when the lifeless, formless accretions of ignorance and self are hewn away. Only that love that seeks no personal gratification or reward, that does not make distinctions and that leaves behind no heartaches can be called divine. Men, clinging to self and to the comfortless shadows of evil, 
are in the habit of thinking of divine love as something belonging to a God who is out of reach, as something outside themselves, and that must forever remain outside. Truly, the love of God is ever beyond the reach of self, but when the heart and mind are emptied of self, then the selfless love, the supreme love, the love that is of God or good, becomes an inward and abiding reality. And this inward realization of holy love is none other than the love of Christ, that is so much talked about and so little comprehended, the love that not only saves the soul from sin, but lifts it also above the power of temptation. But how may one attain to this sublime realization? The answer which truth has always given and will ever give to the question is, Empty thyself and I will fill thee. Divine love cannot be known until self is dead, for self is the denial of love. And how can that which is known be also denied? Not until the stone of self is rolled away from the sepulchre of the soul does the immortal Christ, the pure spirit of love, hitherto crucified, dead and buried, cast off the bands of ignorance and come forth in all the majesty of his resurrection. You believe that Christ of Nazareth was put to death and rose again. I do not say you err in that belief, but if you refuse to believe that the gentle spirit of love is crucified daily upon the dark cross of your selfish desires, then I say you err in this unbelief, and you have not yet perceived, even afar off, the love of Christ. You say that you have tasted of salvation in the love of Christ. Are you saved from your temper, your irritability, your vanity, your personal dislikes, your judgment and condemnation of others? If not, from what are you saved? And wherein have you realized the transforming love of Christ? He who has realized the love that is divine has become a new man and has ceased to be swayed and dominated by the old elements of self. He is known for his patience, his purity, his self-control, his deep charity of heart and his unalterable sweetness. Divine or selfless love is not a mere sentiment or emotion. It is a state of knowledge which destroys the dominion of evil and the belief in evil and lifts the soul into the joyful realization of the supreme good. To the divinely wise, knowledge and love are one and inseparable. It is toward the complete realization of this divine love that the whole world is moving. It was for this purpose that the universe came into existence, and every grasping at happiness, every reaching out of the soul towards objects, ideas and ideals is an effort to realize it. But the world does not realize this love at present because it is grasping at the fleeting shadow and ignoring in its blindness the substance and so suffering and sorrow continue, and must continue, until the world, taught by its self-inflicted pains, discovers the love that is selfless, the wisdom that is calm and full of peace. And this love, this wisdom, this peace, this tranquil state of mind and heart, may be attained too, may be realized by all who are willing and ready to yield up self and who are prepared to humbly enter into a comprehension of all that the giving up of self involves. There is no arbitrary power in the universe 
and the strongest chains of fate by which men are bound are self-forged. Men are chained to that which causes suffering because they desire to be so, because they love their chains, because they think their little dark prison of self is sweet and beautiful, and they are afraid that if they desert that prison, they will lose all that is real and worth having. Ye suffer from yourselves, none else compels, none other holds ye that ye live and die. And the indwelling power which forged the chains and built around itself the dark and narrow prison can break away when its desires and wills to do so, and the soul does will to do so when it has discovered the worthlessness of its prison, when long suffering has prepared it for the reception of the boundless light and love. As the shadow follows the form, and as smoke comes after fire, so effect follows cause, and suffering and bliss follow the thoughts and deeds of men. There is no effect in the world around us but has its hidden or revealed cause, and that cause is in accordance with absolute justice. Men reap a harvest of suffering because, in the near or distant past, they have sown the seeds of evil. They reap a harvest of bliss also as a result of their own sowing of the seeds of good. Let a man meditate upon this. Let him strive to understand it, and he will then begin to sow only seeds of good, and will burn up the tares and weeds which is formerly grown in the garden of his heart. The world does not understand the love that is selfless, because it is engrossed in the pursuit of its own pleasures, and cramped within the narrow limits of perishable interests, mistaken in its ignorance, those pleasures and interests for real and abiding things, caught in the flames of fleshly lusts and burning with anguish, it sees not the pure and peaceful beauty of truth. Feeding upon the swinish husks of error and self-delusion, it is shut out from the mansion of all-seeing love. Not having this love, not understanding it, men institute innumerable reforms which involve no inward sacrifice, and each imagines that his reform is going to right the world forever, while he himself continues to propagate evil by engaging it in his own heart. That only can be called reform, which tends to reform the human heart, for all evil has its rise there, and not until the world, seizing from selfishness and party strife, has learned the lesson of divine love, will it realize the golden age of universal blessedness. Let the rich cease to despise the poor, and the poor to condemn the rich. Let the greedy learn how to give, and the lustful how to grow pure. Let the partisan cease from strife, and the uncharitable begin to forgive. Let the envious endeavour to rejoice with others, and the slanderers grow ashamed of their conduct. Let men and women take this course, and lo, the golden age is at hand. He therefore, who purifies his own heart, is the world's greatest benefactor. Yet though the world is, and will be for many ages to come, shut out from that age of gold, which is the realization of selfless love, you, if you are willing, may enter into it now, by rising above your selfish self. If you will pass from prejudice, hatred and condemnation to gentle and forgiving love. Where hatred, dislike and condemnation are, selfless love does not abide. 
it resides only in the heart that has ceased from all condemnation. You say, how can I love the drunkard, the hypocrite, the sneak, the murderer? I am compelled to dislike and condemn such men. It is true, you cannot love such men emotionally, but when you say that you must perforce dislike and condemn them, you show that you are not acquainted with the great overruling love, for it is possible to attain to such a state of interior enlightenment as will enable you to perceive the train of causes by which these men have become as they are, to enter into their intense sufferings and to know the certainty of their ultimate purification. Possessed of such knowledge, it will be utterly impossible for you any longer to dislike or condemn them, and you will always think of them with perfect calmness and deep compassion. If you love people and speak of them with praise until they in some way thwart you or do something of which you disapprove, and then you dislike them and speak of them with dispraise. You are not governed by the love which is of God. If, in your heart, you are continually arraigning and condemning others, selfless love is hidden from you. He who knows that love is at the heart of all things and has realized the all-sufficing power of that love has no room in his heart for condemnation. Men, not knowing this love, constitutes themselves judge and executioner of their fellows, forgetting that there is the eternal judge and executioner, and in so far as men deviate from them in their own views, their particular reforms and methods, they brand them as fanatical and balance, lacking judgment, sincerity and honesty. In so far as others, approximate to their own standard, do they look upon them as being everything that is admirable. Such are the men who are centered in self, but he whose heart is centered in the supreme love does not so brand and classify men, does not seek to convert men to his own views, not to convince them of the superiority of his methods, knowing the law of love, he lives it and maintains the same calm attitude of mind and sweetness of heart toward all. The debased and the virtuous, the foolish and the wise, the learned and the unlearned, the selfish and the unselfish, receive alike the benediction of his tranquil thought. You can only attain to this supreme knowledge, this divine love, by unremitting endeavor in self-discipline and by gaining victory after victory over yourself. Only the pure in heart see God. And when your heart is sufficiently purified, you will enter into the new birth and the love that does not die nor change nor end in pain and sorrow will be awakened within you and you will be at peace. He who strives for the attainment of divine love is ever seeking to overcome the spirit of condemnation. For where there is pure spiritual knowledge condemnation cannot exist, and only in the heart that has become incapable of condemnation is love perfected and fully realized. The Christian condemns the atheist. The atheist satirizes the Christian. The Catholic and Protestant are ceaselessly engaged in wordy warfare, and the spirit of strife and hatred rules where peace and love should be. He that hateth his brother is a murderer, a crucifier of the divine spirit of love. And until you can regard men of all religions and of no religion 
with the same impartial spirit, with all freedom from dislike and with perfect equanimity, you have yet to strive for that love which bestows upon its possessor freedom and salvation. The realization of divine knowledge, selfless love, utterly destroys the spirit of condemnation, disperses all evil and lifts the consciousness to the height of pure vision where love, goodness, justice are seen to be universal, supreme, all-conquering, indestructible. Train your mind in strong, impartial and gentle thought. Train your heart in purity and compassion. Train your tongue to silence and to true and stainless speech, so shall you enter the way of holiness and peace, and shall ultimately realize the immortal love. So living without seeking to convert, you will convince without arguing, you will teach, not cherishing ambition, the wise will find you out, and without striving to gain men's opinions, you will subdue their hearts. For love is all-conquering, all-powerful, and the thoughts and deeds and words of love can never perish. To know that love is universal, supreme, all-sufficing, to be freed from the trammels of evil, to be quit of the inward unrest, to know that all men are striving to realize the truth, each in his own way, to be satisfied, sorrowless, serene. This is peace, this is gladness, this is immortality, this is divinity, this is the realization of selfless love. I stood upon the shore and saw the rocks resist the onslaught of the mighty sea, and when I thought how all the countless shocks they had withstood through all an eternity, I said, to wear away this solid main, the ceaseless efforts of the waves are vain. But when I thought how they the rocks had rent, and saw the sand and shingles at my feet, poor passive remnants of resistance spent, tumbled and tossed where they the waters meet. Then saw I ancient landmarks neath the waves, and knew the waters held the stones their slaves. I saw the mighty work the waters wrought by patient softness and unceasing flow, how they the proudest promontory brought unto their feet and massy hills laid low, how the soft drops, the adamantine wall, conquered at last and brought to its fall. And then I knew that hard resisting sin should yield at last to love's soft ceaseless roll, coming and going, ever flowing in, upon the proud rocks of the human soul, that all resistance should be spent and passed, and every heart yield unto it at last. End of Part 2 Chapter 4